It's wrong, it's unnatural, I'm never going to do it ever in my life, not even if you pay me a million dollars. These are all things that I said with great conviction many times over as a kid and as a teenager about getting on a plane and flying. <laughs> G'day folks, my name is Mac and I'm a flight attendant. So how did I come from being this precocious, obstinate, terrified, Cornish youngster to enjoying a career that I love so much to this day? Well, I grew up in Cornwall. Does anyone know Cornwall in the UK? Cool, yeah. Uh, thank for Cornish pasties and the Aphex twin. They're t two pillars of my growing up. Thank you. Cool. Cornwall's very sheltered, you know, it's like a place where things go kind of slow. Going at great speed means getting into a tractor without a trailer. <laughs> around the windy roads, but uh, yeah, I was a terrified kid. And uh, I refused to get on a plane, I was too scared of it. My stepdad, he grew up in Australia, and he always vowed to come back out here one day. But when he had a, uh, a son who was refusing to make the trip, kind of an obstacle, he had a plan. My dad was in the Navy. He was on the HMS Ark Royal, a massive uh, was it, um, aircraft carrier. And they had a Sons at Sea week. And invited me and a bunch of lads a week after my 16th birthday to sail out from Portsmouth to Gibraltar. We played softball in the, uh, in the hangar on this aircraft. We went up to the bridge. And because of the proximity of the shower block to the, uh, to the workshops and stuff, there was me, I you know, hadn't even discovered that I was gay yet, but there was the shower blocks and there was these uh, blokes coming in and they're getting changed right in front of me at eye level while I'm laying in bed and that was interesting. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> great week. And um, because the minimum age for drinking in Gibraltar is 16, me and the lads, we went out onto the rock and we discovered Southern Comfort at 40 pence a throw. <laughs> the downside of that is that being 16, just a few hours later, I was suffering the effects of the worst hangover ever and it was painful and it was awful. And the next day, my whole body and mind just wanted to die. And... I thought, okay, this is a bad thing. My dad said, right, time to go home. Great, let's set sail. No, not setting sail. You're flying back, you fucking what? <laughs> Didn't tell me that, did you, dad? No, I had to get on a plane, hung over, my whole body screaming out death, and this plane, I mean, this is a military plane, so we're, we're not talking flight attendants, we're not talking comfy seats, no snacks, no in-flight movie. It was turbulent as hell, there was storms. It was shaky all over the place. I'm vomiting, I'm just breathing vomit gas. <laughs> you know? This was validating every negative feeling, every opinion that I've ever had about flying and setting foot on a plane. Not a good start to the plan, Dad, to get me to Australia, no. A few years later, I decided I want to go to America. I'm 19 years old. It's like, I'm going to have to get over this. I really want to do this. I want to teach on a summer camp to the Camp America program. I really had to force myself to do it. Virgin Atlantic flight, it was actually pretty good. <laughs> the flight attendants could tell I was shitting myself. So they came and take, gave me attention. They told me what the bings and the pops and the noises were for. I'm like, oh, yeah, the food was pretty... Well, I'm a shit cook, but of course airplane food's great. To be honest, I'm still a shit cook, and I still think the airplane food's great. As long as I don't have to cook it, good job. But, <laughs> but you know, every seat had a Super Nintendo to play. There was movies. To be honest, I didn't even want that flight to end. So I kind of got over that fear a bit. So that's how I kind of took my journey of being absolutely terrified. And several years later, I've settled in Australia. 
and I'm dating my second uh, boyfriend, a guy called Trev. He, he, Trev wasn't really good to me. He, uh, yeah, but he actually said that if we were to have a future together, I would have a circumcision. <laughs> it's wrong, it's not natural, never in a million years. <laughs> no, if you pay me a million dollars. No, still, it's all good, yeah. <laughs> Trev, ancient history. But he did say, Mac, you know what? You'd actually be a pretty good flight attendant. I thought, I think you're on something there, mate. So I then started my career. I was with Anset. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. There's a generation of people who don't even know what Anset was anymore. So it's kind of scary. I work with colleagues now. I say, I was with Anset. What? It's, it's, no, it's a generation thing. But anyway, that's how old I am. Just put it in perspective. Anyway. But I get fear. I get people who are scared of flying. I get people who are nervous. My all-time favorite passenger is a lady who, she was white-knuckled. She was in the window seat. And most of the time, it's just a little bit like this. So we, d we actually don't even notice it. You know, it's just part of the, you know, I don't think anything of it. But she's absolutely convinced we're going to crash. She's white-knuckled. She's going, excuse me, why is it bumpy? It's really, really bumpy. I said, we've just run over a bird. She goes, Look another window. <laughs> Where's the fucking bird? I just walked away and left her to it. Um, another lady, again, pretty nervous, full flight. I was at the back of the 717, noisy engines either side. And she goes, Excuse me, like, is there anything you can do about the noise? I was like, well, Not really, you know. But then, this is before Karen's became a meme, okay? Apologies to anyone called Karen here, but, but she adopted that voice and she goes, well, uh, complete with a head tilt, why don't you go and speak to the captain and see what he can do? I'm like, I'll be right back. <laughs> Went off to the flight deck, told the pilot, told the captain, he said, you know what, go tell her that I'll switch the left engine off. So <laughs> now I must admit, when I have a difficult passenger who I know is just a, di just a dick, I do adopt a bit of a stereotypical camp flight attendant voice. <laughs> Just to, I go down and say, well, the captain has actually switched that engine off. Has that made a difference? And she goes, oh yes, that's much better, thank you. <laughs> Passages around are like. <laughs> so, and then about half an hour later, I actually went back, I just couldn't let, couldn't let it go. I went back and said, so, I don't know if you noticed, but because we've been running on one engine, like, we've actually done a circle. We've just passed Perth for the third time. She's like leaning over like, where? <laughs> yeah. She's a nervous liar. All right. But the point is, the nurse, but it is typically the big burly blokes with the tats and everything that they get most scared of flying. And I get it. It's irrational, you know, so I sit down with them and say, mate, I get it. I used to be terrified of flying. And it's like, oh, but we're going to crash, we're not, you know. Let's face it, we live in WA. We're very lucky to live in WA. No terrorist is ever going to trouble us. We're the safest place on earth. People think Perth, you know, like, let's attack Perth. They're going up Scotland, right? You know? <laughs> in WA, our weather is great. Our planes are safe. Our skies are fantastic. So I know that every flight is going to be a safe one and a good one but I get if you're a bit nervous, so feel free to be on one of my flights and I'll have a chat if you're a bit nervous. Now, I am also a rock climber who's scared of heights. <laughs> but that's another story.